So I've never been to heaven. Uh, planning to get there one day, hopefully a long time from now, but I've never been, so I don't really know what it's like. Uh, I know what the Bible kind of has to say about heaven, the images that we get. We know that it'll be a place of no pain and no suffering and no tears. Uh, the Bible often compares it to a great banquet. I'm excited to be there. I'm excited to meet Jesus. I, I know a general idea of what it might be like. And then when it comes to heaven, I have another category, and those are my hopes about heaven. Uh, see, I hope that heaven will feel kind of like a crisp fall evening at Kyle Field. And, and, and in heaven... <laughs> We won't blow that 25 point lead, okay? It's gonna be great. I hope that heaven is a lot like Cameron Indoor Stadium where the Duke Blue Devils play basketball and we are just trouncing all over North Carolina and that feels really good. I hope, uh, I hope that heaven uh, has, has a, a replica of Augusta, Augusta National Golf Club uh, and that in my resurrected body, I have a good golf game. I have a lot of hopes about heaven. And one of those things I hope about heaven is this. I hope that I will get to the opportunity to thank the people that made sure that I was in heaven with them. I really hope that, that I can see the people, that I can talk to the people that are already there or that are not there yet, and just to be able to say thank you, because of you, I'm in heaven. I hope that I, I get to talk to my parents and, and say thank you for bringing me to church. I hope I get to see Miss Rosie Bates, who taught me in Sunday school from about age four to about age eight, 80 year old saint of the church. I hope that I get to see uh, my, my high school youth pastor. I hope that I get to see uh, my debate coach in high school. I hope that I get to see my, 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 uh, my, my baseball coach, Coach Jones, who taught us about faith. I hope I get to see all of those people and just say thank you. Because of your faithfulness, because you cared enough about me to share the gospel with me, I'm here with you today. So let me turn that question on its head a little bit. And this is the big idea for today as we wrap up this sermon series called Speakeasy. Who will be in heaven because of you? Who have you invested in? Who have you shared the gospel with? Who have you brought along and introduced to Jesus? Now I understand that at its face, that question doesn't make a lot of sense because we know that nobody will be in heaven because of us, right? We believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. And so it's him and his blood and his sacrifice for us that gets us to heaven. But you get the idea. Who did you introduce to Jesus? Who will be in heaven because of you? Today, I wanna to help you in a very simple message, populate that list. And let me go and say this, this message, this sermon this morning is probably not gonna be the best thing you've ever heard, but we're gonna get really, really practical. Because as we've seen the past couple of weeks, our mission, our purpose in this life is to share the gospel, to introduce people to Jesus so that one day we will be in heaven with them. So really, it's gonna be a very basic message. Here's what I'm gonna convince you to do by the end of this message. I'm gonna convince you to make a list. And that list is the people that you are gonna to commit to sharing the gospel with, to sharing your story with, to inviting to church. It could be three people, it could be five people, it could just be one person, but I want you to make a list. And then as we do, we'll be invitational, we'll share the gospel with people, and then we'll see heaven be more and more populated because of the work of the gospel in and through us. Okay, so for our type A'ers out there, we're gonna be talking about this list in four different ways, four point message. We're gonna talk about why you should make a list, who you should put on the list, what you should do with that list and how you should interact with the people on your list. Okay, so just four easy questions. Let's start with this one. Why should you make a list? Well, very simply, this is putting into practice what we've been talking about the past couple of weeks about evangelism. And here's what we know and here's what the stats back up. Most of us, if not all of us, if you would consider yourself a follower of Jesus Christ, uh, you get and you believe this basic idea that we should share our faith. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense that if we have all of this hope and we have all this joy and we have abundant and eternal life in Jesus Christ, then you should want to share that with people. We believe that on a theoretical scale, but what the stats show is that on a practical level, we don't like to do it and we don't. I ran across a study this week that asked millennial Christians like myself, uh, whether they believe that they should share their faith, they should share the gospel. And 90% of millennial believers in Jesus say, yes, evangelism is a good thing. And then later on down the survey, there was a follow-up question. They asked this, will you or have you shared the gospel with somebody or is that too intolerant? 
And over half of respondents say that they wouldn't share the gospel on a one-to-one -one basis. They would not evangelize. What does that say? It says that theoretically we believe in this stuff, but practically we get the heebie-jeebies, the holy heebie-jeebies. We don't know if we should do it or not. So really making a list is just saying, I'm going to put this into practice. And the Bible has a lot to say about this, that if you have been renewed and restored and redeemed by Jesus Christ, then you view this world and you view other people differently. This is what the apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, starting in verse 16. He says, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Keep that in mind. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and behold, the new has come. And all of this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself. And then he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And then entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, Paul says, we are ambassadors for Christ. And God is making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, this is the most uh, simple formulation of the gospel in the New Testament. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Okay, a lot going on here. Let's focus on two things. The first is that very first verse. Paul says that if you are a new creation in Christ, then no longer do you see people just as flesh. No longer do you just see people as mother or father or as accountant or teacher or, or by their race or by their income. Instead, we see deeper. We put on lenses to say that each person is not just a person, but a soul in need of saving. A soul for whom Christ died. When you look out the world, you see people in need of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he says, we've done that because we have been reconciled to God. He uses this economic term. I'm not an accountant guy, but I understand that reconciliation means that you are made right, that an account is made right. And so he says, by the blood of Jesus Christ, you have been made right with God the Father. And then he says, because you've been made right with God the Father, you have a mission, you have a ministry of reconciliation. He uses an economic term, and then he borrows a political term, ambassadors. He says, because you have been reconciled to God the Father through God the Son, Jesus Christ, you are an ambassador. What does an ambassador do? An ambassador lives in a foreign nation and represents their king or their president. So he says, we as believers in Jesus Christ, we live in a foreign land. We were made for heaven, but we're here on earth. And while we're here on earth, we are ambassadors. And I love this term because it, it really bolsters what Pastor Luann talked about last week. I love that she said that so many of us are worried about uh, feeling dumb or looking like an idiot, I think was her words, not mine. And so we don't, we don't share the gospel. And one of the reasons for that is we're scared of the questions. What if we share about Jesus and they say, hey, yeah, if Jesus is good and God is in control, then why do bad things happen? On top of that, why do bad things happen to good people? These are amazingly difficult questions to answer. But the beauty of being an ambassador is we don't have to have all the answers. We can give that simple answer, I don't know. Let me go ask the king. Paul says that if you've been reconciled to God, then everyone you see is a soul in need of saving. That's the way we view our neighbors. Why do we make a list? Because every soul needs saving and because we have a mission together. So, so let's spend a little bit more time on the second question. Who should I put on my list? Who should I put on my list? Now, here's what I know is that, and I've already seen a couple of you pull out your phone, you start jotting names down. Some of you already know. Right? The spirit has been moving in you for a long time that you need to invite a friend to church or you need to share the gospel with a neighbor. And so this is just the confirmation that yes, you should go and do that. But for some of us, this is gonna be a more difficult question. Because let's be honest, as humans, we, we are pack animals. Okay, we kind of have this herd mentality. And what happens is that we, we, we surround ourselves with people who think like us and dress like us and have the same interests as us and at some level have the same beliefs as us. 
and hear me, it's not a bad thing to have Christian friends. You should have Christian friends. But my fear is that in this day and age, we have retreated so much that we don't have anybody in our circle who doesn't know Jesus Christ. And where I wanna press you a little bit is that if that's your case, if that's your situation that everybody you spend time with knows Jesus Christ, uh, you might have a, a numerical issue and a gospel issue. Okay, let's talk, talk numerically first. Here's what I, I, I experience in my own heart. I think I, I don't need to share the gospel with people because we live in America, right? We're a Christian nation. Surely everybody at some level believes in Jesus Christ. But you know the stats, you know that increasingly this is not true. Uh, the most recent study says that about 68% of Americans self-identify as some Christian flavor. Okay, whether that's non-denominational or Methodist or evangelical or Roman Catholic, 68% identify that when they're checking off a survey, they would say, yes, I am a Christian. But if you go a little bit deeper, I ran across another study this week that says really only about five to 10% of Americans are actively following Jesus. Five to 10%. I feel like that's a little bit low, but let's just take that, at, 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 let's just assume that's true. That means that, that about nine in 10 people that you encounter at the grocery store, at the office, at your kid's football game, about nine in 10 of them are not actively following Jesus Christ, involved in a church, reading their Bibles, praying, giving, serving, nine in 10. But pastor, don't know if you realize this, we live in deep red Montgomery County, okay? Like this is the buckle of the Bible belt. Surely things are better around here. So I did a little uh, very unscientific study this week, okay? Very unscientific. Um, I'm, I'm, I've said this before, I'm not a math guy, okay? Once I started putting letters into math, it stopped making sense to me. Math is supposed to be about numbers, okay? So I'm not a math guy, but I did a little study, very informal, uh, unintelligent study, just to see uh, about the woodlands. This, uh, I said city last night, we are a township, Linda Nelson. Okay, we are a township. <laughs> Let's just talk about this township. Okay, you think there there's, there's, really are so many amazing churches in our community, right? It seems like every street corner, there is a church or two, okay? So, so I did a very unscientific study. I, I went to the almighty Google and I, I made a list of all the churches in the woodlands. There's about 30, give or take a couple, about 30 churches in the woodlands. Okay, and these are amazing churches. I, I know many of the pastors, many of the congregations faithfully following Jesus, amazing places. 30 churches. And then I, I asked the question, how many people are going to church in the woodlands? Now I understand this, that not everybody who lives in the woodlands goes to a church in the woodlands and not everybody who goes to a church in the woodlands is from the woodlands. I get that unscientific, I've said it four times, okay? But let's ask this question. <laughs> How many citizens live in our township? Uh, I, I turned to the always, always perfect and never lying Wikipedia and Wikipedia <laughs> said this, that the estimated 2024 population of the Woodlands is 115,760. Okay, so, so again, simple math here. I divided 115,716 by 30. That number is 3,857. What does that number represent? That number represents that if our township was completely saturated, that if every single person that you live, work, and play with goes to church and is involved in a community, then every church in our town should average 3,857 people in worship every week. Now, by my count, there's two, maybe three churches in the Woodlands, of which ours is one of them, that, that reaches that attendance threshold. Okay, and I say that not to dog the other churches. I love the other churches, but I do that to say this. We have an issue. We have so many people all around us that aren't involved in the life of a church, and if they're not involved in the life of a church, and they're not following Jesus. So who do we put on our list? We put those people on our list. And if those people who aren't involved in the life of a local church are not in your circle, then numerically, you might be isolating yourself a little bit. And then on top of that, not only numerically, but it's a gospel issue as well. One of the things that got Jesus crucified is that he didn't spend time with just the, the believers. Instead, he went out and he hung out with the prostitutes and the tax collectors and the Gentiles and the cat people. He, he spent time with the people <laughs> that you weren't supposed to spend time with. 
And, and when people got mad at him, he, they said, Jesus, why are you spending time with these people? He, he said, I've come not to heal the healthy, but to heal the sick. He says, I haven't come for the found, I've come for the lost. And then there's one scene in Luke chapter 14, it was a part of my weekly Bible reading this week where Jesus is at a banquet. And he tells to this person who is leading the banquet, it says this in Luke 14, 12, he said to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner, when you throw a banquet, don't invite your friends or your brothers or your sisters or your relatives or your rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, invite the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they can't repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. A couple of things here. One is a simple lesson in evangelism. It can be hard to have those spiritual conversations, but over and over again, just as heaven is a banquet, one of the ways that we reach out in love and care and compassion and hospitality to our neighbors is to eat together. And maybe that's gonna be one of your action steps for the people on your list. You invite them over for dinner. You break bread together and have good conversations with them. And Jesus says, when you do that, don't invite the people who have everything. Instead, invite people in need, the poor, the blind, the crippled, the people with some kind of need. Okay, now let's take Luke 14 and apply it with 2 Corinthians that we read earlier on in the message. Okay, Jesus says, invite people in need. 2 Corinthians says, look not at the flesh, but at the spirit. So, so who needs to be on your list? People who don't already know Jesus. People are, who are in need of salvation. That seems very basic. Let me say what I'm trying to say. Okay, you are not allowed to put people on your list that already know Jesus. Let's take that a step further. You are not allowed to invite people to our church that already go to another church, okay? I am not in the business of stealing sheep from other flocks, okay? That's not what we're about. And I say this over and over again, um, but, but I am a capital K kingdom of God kind of person. I am not a, a little K kingdom of loft person. Okay, this is not about raising up our attendance. We ran out of bread last week at the 11 o'clock service. We've got people, okay? But instead, we are invita inviting people who don't already know Jesus Christ, which means this. If, you're, if your kid's new teacher goes to harvest, you can't put them on your list. <laughs> okay, if your neighbor is a faithful Roman Catholic, don't put them on your list. If, 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 if your friend, if your coworker goes to church project, don't put them on your list. I, I have uh, two amazing neighbors, Mike and Pam. Love Mike and Pam to death. They saved us during Hurricane Barrel. Um, they, amazing couple. We spend time with them. They've watched our kids before. We've eaten with them. We've had them over. Love Mike and Pam. Mike and Pam go to Woodlands Church. Okay, uh, that, that's Pastor uh, Shook's church down the road. Uh, I've spent some time with Chris and Carrie Shook. Love and respect them dearly. And, and so I know that they're involved in that church. So listen to me, not once have I ever invited Mike and Pam to Loft. Why? Because they already have a church home. Okay, I'm so much of a kingdom guy that, that really this has happened on multiple occasions. Somebody has come up to me or sent me an angry email after a service um, that they didn't like something that was happening here. Maybe our theology, usually the sermon, something was wrong, okay? <laughs> and so I have no problem, and I've done this many times, recommending other churches to them. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that. We are a capital K kingdom type people. You put people on your list that aren't a part of that capital K kingdom. Okay, so that's who you put on your list and who you shouldn't put on your list. Third question is this, how do I decide who to put on my list? And the first thing I'm gonna encourage you to do that if you don't already have those names in your head, I'm gonna invite you to pray and we're gonna do it at the end of the service as well. I'm gonna invite you to pray. Pray for God to reveal those people that you interact with. Pray for God to reveal those people that you pass by, that you know you just need to share a little bit of the hope that you have. And then I'm gonna encourage you to take it a step further. To take it a step further to say this, not only should you pray for who to put on your list, but then begin to pray that God will open a door that you could have a spiritual conversation with them. Now, here's what we know. Um, God does not answer every single prayer in the way that we want him to. 
Okay, and I know there's a lot of witnesses here to that. We, we pray and God listens and God answers, but, but maybe more often than not, God doesn't answer our prayers in the way that we want him to. But here's what I can almost guarantee you, 95, 98% certainty, that if you pray to God, God, give me an opportunity to witness to my faith, to John Doe, God's gonna answer that prayer. So that's a dangerous prayer. And I say that just to say, only pray this prayer if you're really serious about it. Only pray this prayer if you're actually willing to share your faith with somebody else or invite them to church. How do you decide to put on your list? You begin to pray. And then let me also say this. Here's what, what I can kind of sense and here's what I can kind of know. Uh, you, you, you know that you wanna make a physical list and I'm gonna encourage you to actually write it down. You know, you wanna do that, but, but it might feel a little bit weird. See, what I want you to do is I want you to write these names down, uh, maybe on a sticky note, you put it on your mirror. That way every day you have this reminder. I want you to write it on an index card and then I want you to put it on your dashboard. Just cover up that check engine light. If you can't see it, it's not there, okay? God will bless that, okay? I want you to put it somewhere that you can see it. And listen to me, that is kind of weird. Okay, because you may be worried, like, what if I invite this person over for dinner and then uh, after they, they check whether there's dust on my baseboards, because every guest does that apparently, they're going to check the dust on the baseboard and then they're going to go into my uh, bathroom and they're going to see their name on the list. And they're like, is this your hit list? This is weird, right? <laughs> you, you may feel that way. Right, that, that may be a little bit of a hesitation for you. But here's what I want to remind you. Every single person here this morning if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, at some point in time, you were on somebody else's list. Okay, they, they might not have written your name down like this, but somebody cared enough about you. Someone loved you enough. Somebody saw you not just in the flesh, but as a soul in need of saving, that they would invite you to church, that they would share the gospel with you, that they would mentor you, that they would coach you through a difficult season of your life. You were on somebody's list. And little side note here, here's a, another uh, extra bonus uh, uh, homework for you. If that person who is responsible for your faith um, hasn't gone to glory yet, I wanna challenge you this week, write them a letter. Send them an email, give them a call, shoot them a text. And just say, thank you, because one day I'm gonna be in heaven because of you. Now, could you imagine the joy that you must feel opening that kind of letter? to realize I invested my life in somebody and it worked and it paid off. Could you imagine how that must feel? And I want you to think about that feeling as you're putting people on your list. To say maybe five, 10, 15 years from now, I'm gonna get a letter that just says, thank you for introducing me to Jesus. Last question is this, what do we do with the people on our list? We've prayed about it. We've got our list of three to five names. We know that these are people that God is calling us to, to witness to our faith to. What then do we do with the list? Um, there's been a couple of, uh, of big concepts that we've said over the past two weeks uh, with our view on evangelism. One of those is that evangelism is all about relationships. Right? The, the street corner evangelism rarely, if ever, works. We, we've got to build a relationship so that it's strong enough to hold the weight of truth. But then another one that I said in week one was this key thing about evangelism. Don't be weird. Okay? You remember this? Don't be weird. So, so one of the good icebreaker questions that I found is that when I'm beginning to develop that relationship and I want to kind of know where they're at on spiritual journey, I ask this question. Do you have a church home? Okay, that's a really good question because sometimes they say, yeah, I, I, I go to Trinity Episcopal and I say, tell me about your church. And they get to brag on the church and the amazing ministries and what they're doing in the gospel. And I love those conversations and I know they're not allowed to be on my list. But if they don't have a church home, then we begin to have a conversation of why and maybe you could come try ours. Okay, I, I use this tactic um, in a place that I spend a lot of time and that's the sauna. Okay, I understand it's Texas. Like I don't need to go to a wooden box to do that. I could just step outside for four minutes and be fine. But, but I, I spend time uh, for my mental and physical health in the sauna every morning. And, and really talk about a captive audience. It's the sauna. <laughs> okay, wooden box, dude sweating in towels, right? Nothing going on. And so really good conversations happen. And a lot of times I've built up these conversations and then I've asked them, do you have a church home? 
Okay, that's a good question. That's not a weird question. I've often thought in a situation like that, I could get really weird really quick. <laughs> okay. Wooden box, 200 degrees. So you think this is hot? <laughs> yeah, try living your life apart from Jesus Christ, the savior of your soul, times infinity for infinity ever. Like, don't do that, that's weird. Just don't. Right, you could ask them a simple question. Do you have a church home? And then let the spirit give you words. Maybe that's an opportunity for you to share your faith. Maybe it's an opportunity to share the reason for the hope that you have. Maybe it's an opportunity to share your story. Or, or maybe you just make it simple and you invite them to church. We've made this really easy for you. On your way out, there's a stanchion sign and then over at Connection Point, uh, we've printed out some cards. And you can take as many of these as you want. You can stick them in your car, stick them in your wallet, whatever. Uh, this one says, come sit with me. That's accountability that you have to be in church so that they can sit with you. Uh, others say, worship with us. One of them has our new sermon series that's kicking off next week called The One That You Feed. We're gonna be talking about the, the, the forces that we have in ourselves of good and bad, of lightness and dark and how to feed the right one. Take one of these, give them a card, say, come to church with me. And let me tell you this, if we will take this call seriously, to pray, to make our list, and then to witness to our faith. Here's what I can promise you. That this place will begin to fill up just a little bit more. We'll start more services, it's fine. But I care much less about that and much more about the people that will be in heaven. Because you and I were willing to be reconciled to Jesus Christ and then use the ministry of reconciliation to be ambassadors for the gospel, to share the love and grace of Jesus Christ with as many people as we can so that one day when that person gets to heaven, they'll look at you, they'll look at me, and they'll say, thank you. I'm here because of you. Let me pray for us, Law family. Holy Spirit, we thank you for the mission field that you have put us on. We thank you that you think enough about us, that you care enough about us to not only redeem our souls, but then to send us out with a mission and a purpose. And God, we know that we are imperfect vessels. You have chosen us to be ambassadors and we're gonna fail, but God, we thank you that you never fail. So Holy Spirit, I pray that even now you're beginning to put names in our minds, faces in our minds of people, real people for whom you love. That we will commit to praying for them. That we will commit to sharing the love and grace of Jesus with them. That we will commit to just be in relationship with them so that maybe they might see glimpses of you in us. God, give us the motivation, not just to be excited about it today, but throughout the rest of the week and the month and the year to be praying for these people, people that you love, people that you have restored, people that you have redeemed, and people that we all want to get to heaven with us. Father, we love you and we thank you that it's not about our actions, but it's about the finished work of the cross. Jesus' blood allows us to be reconciled to you. It's in his mighty name that we pray, amen.